So thank you so much for coming to our first Common Ground event this semester. We have five more coming, five more. Yeah, right on, there we go, thank you. Um, this one is uh, Two Voices, uh, One Planet, Navigating the Climate Crisis. We welcome Rihanna Gunn-Wright, Bob Inglis, here today, as well as our, our own Peter Canavo. Uh, our mission is to explore cross-boundary political thought and complex social issues. Common Ground brings highly respected thought leaders to the Hamilton campus to participate in small classroom dialogues and large event discussions. And they have already been to classes today and will be tomorrow as well. I wanna thank our Common Ground team, Assistant Director Katie Stewart, Program Assistant Kim Ritchie, and our student ambassadors. Student ambassadors, could you raise your hands, please? Yay. They will uh, help with our questions later on. Uh, they, in fact, they have, speaking of, of our uh, 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 ambassadors, they've started a few initiatives, including a Common Ground Instagram account, at Common Ground HC. Our student ambassadors are running an Instagram giveaway for students that ends tonight. To enter, students should follow Common Ground HC on the Instagram, share the giveaway post on your story, and tag three Hamilton students in the comments of our post. And you could win a Euphoria gift card, or the grand prize, a very fresh pair of AirPods. Oh. So, yeah, I, yeah it's good stuff. <laughs> so the college is grateful uh, to Mary Helen and Robert Morris, Eve Niquette and Charles Poole, and Lori and David Hess. Their support for tonight is indispensable. And let me plug our next Common Ground event, which is next week, next Wednesday, 7 February, and it's called Remove, Modify, or Replace working across the aisle to confront Confederate commemoration in the military. Uh, Admiral Michelle Howard, who was our commencement speaker last year, will be on the panel, uh, as well as the Republican and Democrat who are on the naming commission. I'll be on the panel too, and we're gonna look at the intersection of politics, history, and memory. And now it's my honor to introduce our moderator, the chair of Hamilton College's government department, Peter Canavo. <laughs> I figured you were going to start doing the wave here in a bit. <laughs> uh, he is the author of The Working Landscape, Founding, Preservation, and the Politics of Place. He is the co-editor of Engaging Nature, Environmentalism, Concepts of Nature, and the Study of the Political Theory Canon. He has contributed chapters uh, to the leading books because he is an expert on the intersection of political and environmental theory. I'm grateful for Peter for not only agreeing to moderate this important conversation, but it was his idea to invite our two speakers. Please join me in welcoming our panel tonight. Thank you. Well, thank you, Ty. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm really honored to be moderating for our two uh, distinguished guests who I will uh, momentarily introduce. Um, just a, a few comments about the, the issue we're discussing. Obviously, you all know about climate change. Um, it is, I would argue, the most important issue facing humanity today. Um, and it threatens the roughly stable planetary system we've had for the past 10,000 years. And that has really enabled the rise of our civilization. Um, I think we hit a turning point this summer um, with the, uh, the really extreme heat and fires, uh, I think we're, we're seeing the, the issue, uh, really, uh, catching on. Um, it's, it's been a while though, since we've been aware of this issue, uh, publicly. I mean, scientists were talking about in the 19th century, um, uh, and throughout the 20th century, in, there's increasing concern about it. Um, in, in June 1988, uh, Jim Hansen, atmospheric scientist at NASA, warned uh, a Senate hearing that we had to start addressing this. If you told me, and I, I've said this to other people, if you told me then that it would take 34 years from that point to pass the first major federal climate law, you could have knocked me over with a feather. Um, so here we are. I mean, we're addressing and uh, uh, facing a threat we should have addressed long ago, but it's not too late to avoid the worst of this crisis. But even more than that, it's it's also an opportunity to ge uh, generate the sorts of 
political, social, and economic change that might actually build a better society for ourselves and future generations. And again, the politics on this issue are shifting. I think both of our two guests would uh, attest to that. Um, and that raises the question, not only whether we should address this problem, which I think the answer is obvious, but how we should do it. And climate change really entangles all aspects of our economy, our political institutions, political processes, our conceptions of rights and responsibility, individual liberty and collective, um, collective responsibility, racial, economic, and other forms of social justice. Um, the types of solutions we pursue now will shape society for generations to come. And the solutions we pursue now will reflect the kind of society we want in the future. Um, so in developing tonight's program, as Ty said, we um, decided on guests who are both interested in solving the climate problem, but come at it from rather different perspectives. Perspectives that I think foreshadow some of the future debates as we really uh, pursue climate policy more and more vigorously. Um, our two guests tonight both take the climate crisis very seriously, and they've done important and inspiring work in um, pushing us to address it and coming up with solutions. Um, but they come from different places in terms of their politics, their diagnosis of the problem, and their solutions. And they offer different visions of climate politics and what a climate-friendly future would look like, whether it requires fundamental transformation of politics and economics, as well as other structural factors like race relations, whether it entails fixing flaws in the existing system, especially market failures. So there's room for disagreement here. At the same time, our two guests demonstrate that tackling climate change can be a goal that cuts across the political spectrum. And so they may show us the way to a productive dialogue about climate solutions across philosophical divides and also how we can learn from one another in the process. So I will introduce our two guests. Um, Rihanna Gunn-Wright is the Director of Climate Policy at the Roosevelt Institute, and she leads the think tank's research at the intersection of climate policy, public investment, racial equity, and public power. Um, she was the policy director for New Consensus, charged with developing and promoting the Green New Deal, of which she's one of the architects and worked with um, people like uh, uh, Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Um, she was policy director for Abdul El Sayed's Michigan gubernatorial campaign, and she's worked as a policy analyst for the Detroit Health Department, um, acted as the Merriam uh, Chamberlain Fellow of Women in Public Policy at the Institute for Women's Policy Research, and served on the policy team for, for former First Lady Michelle Obama. Um, and um, in it, um, um, she graduated from Yale and was a Rhodes Scholar at Oxford. And more recently, she's raised significant concerns about the impact of the Inflation Reduction Act on climate justice and racial equity. Bob Inglis um, is the executive director of RepublicEN.org. Uh, he was elected to the US Congress in 1992 and represented the Greensville and Spartanburg, South Carolina area from 93 to 98, and then returned to practice of commercial real estate law for a few years. And then in 2004 was reelected to Congress and served until losing reelection to the South Carolina Republican primary of 2010, a loss partly due to his support for action on climate change. In 2011, he worked full time into promoting free enterprise action on climate change and launched the Energy and Enterprise Initiative at George Mason University in, in 2012. And in the fall of 2014, um, uh, the Energy and Enterprise Initiative became RepublicEN.org. Um, and they focus on conservative market-based approaches to climate change. Um, and uh, he is a graduate of Duke University uh, undergrad and a graduate from Virginia Law School. So why don't we give a warm Hamilton welcome to these two guys. Okay, so I'd like to start off um, that climate change is an issue you both made central to your work. Um, 
And um, I'd like to ask each of you how you came to this issue and then lay out your approach to climate change. And also maybe um, might uh, touch on how serious do you think the climate crisis is? Is it an emergency? So I will, um, uh, we could each go in turn. Uh, sure, Rihanna, why don't I can you start. start. With you? Um, so I came to work on climate change in a, in a relatively roundabout way. So, I started working on policy or like in policy right after college. I was the Chamberlain Fellow at the Institute for Women's Policy Research, IWPR. Um, studied policy for graduate school. My undergraduate thesis was about welfare policy. Um, but my focus had largely been, I worked on a lot of different issues, but the core of my work was always around like poverty and inequity. And so um, that's where I worked on in various ways. I worked on um, college access and retention for single parents um, and student parents, then for first-gen students. And then in Detroit, I, that's when I started to do a lot of work on environmental injustice, which um, at the time, the conversation between about environmental injustice and the connection to, cl to the climate crisis was happening in the U.S., but in a very, in like environmental justice spaces, but not in the larger conversation. So even as I was working on environmental justice, I wasn't really thinking a ton about climate change. I was working on stuff like there's an incinerator in the middle of the city. 85% of that garbage comes from neighboring suburbs with two, three times the median income of Detroit that are mostly white. And it is creating the worst asthma rates in the state, right? Like that's the sort of stuff I'm working on or um, lead in older housing. Um, and so it wasn't actually until um, my boss at that job ran for or ran for governor i became his policy director and he was very focused on he's he's an epidemiologist and he's focused on what's called public social determinants of health so he was thinking a lot about climate change and environmental justice so part of my portfolio what became like environmental policy writ large including mm -hmm. climate change but i still had fellows who wrote that bless them um, and, but I learned a lot. And then what happened was we lost the primary. I'm looking for a job just to hold me over until I take the LSAT and finally make my mother happy. Mm -hmm. Um, and lo and behold, because of connections on the campaign, um, I was asked to work on the Green New Deal because it was about climate, but was also about how do we, um, address climate in a way that uses this, what's going to be a monumental shift in our economy and our energy system to help build out the type of social safety net, just the type of society and economy we want long-term. How do we sort of make that transformation? Um, and because I had a background in social policy and had done all these things, they were like, you see like you could do this, which also translated is you seem like the only person dumb enough to do this in three months with two other people. And I was in fact that young and that dumb. Uh, and I had so much energy then, it's incredible. <laughs> um, and so I say yes. And so that's how I ended up working on, um, on the climate crisis. But again, even that entrance was about climate change sort of, and its effect on systems writ large. And so I can't say I've ever approached climate as just an environmental issue. Um, and so that of course informed that and the work that the Green New, New Deal sort of spun out to create and the connections with climate justice movements in particular, and also learning that I myself had lived in a frontline community, meaning a community with like much higher levels of pollution than average because of, likely because of exposure to like the highway and I live near a major street, et cetera. 
and I have to, actually had asthma uh, growing up, and I would say over half the kids on my block had asthma. It was so common that I thought it was just a childhood disease. Right. And so learning how environmental injustice had actually affected me and like shaped my life um, also sort of informed very much how I approach climate. Um, and so the way that I understand the climate crisis is as a systemic crisis, right, as something that um, affects not just our environment, but our economy, our society so much of our society down to like the types of fabric and the clothes that we wear is connected to the fossil fuel industry and fossil fuel economies. And so I think about it that way. I also think of it as the result, um, not only, but one of the big drivers of climate of the climate crisis, I do think is white supremacy, colonialism, that sort of approach to extraction, and also the way that and we'll talk about this more later, but the way that white supremacy um, in particular creates this ability to be able to use fossil fuels without limit in part because you can dump the worst parts of production, extraction, and use onto communities with the least power and sort of create a, a fractured reality for the people who understand most why we need to shift off are the people with the least power and the people with the most power don't necessarily until very recently with the climate crisis think that we have a problem because they don't live in the worst of it. Um, and so that is how I approach uh, the climate crisis. And then um, much like I worked on the Green New Deal for, the, for a reason, I do think addressing the climate crisis, not just because of how expansive the issue itself is. When you're talking about climate crisis, all of a sudden you're talking about energy systems, how they're run, who benefits, immigration, right? You're talking about food supply, you're talking about ecosystems, you're talking about oceans, right? You're talking about even down to trade rules, right? Like you're talking, there's so many things that the climate crisis touches. So I'm also of the opinion that like, addressing the climate crisis, both because of its breadth and because of the deep impact of power, right? Like you're taught fossil fuel companies are some of the most powerful corporations in human history, right? They have so much money and that's just the privately owned ones. We haven't even talked about like national, right? Nations that own their own or um, that control, the oil all comes from sort of like their national company. Um, and so the, the level of power, the sort of dire straits that at least the U.S. democracy is in, right, I just think that because of the power issues, it also requires a mass movement to address, to create the kind of political pressure that you need within our current system, and the only, I think, vision of climate policy that is possible, that it could possibly drive that sort of movement, enthusiasm, long-term commitment is one of transformation. So how did I come to this? And how do I analyze it? And uh, what how, do you how urgent should we be? Oh, yes, I do in fact think it's an emergency. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, so, it's like this. Um, let's see, my first six years in Congress, I said that climate change was nonsense. All I knew was that Al Gore was for it. Um, and in as much as I represented a very conservative district in South Carolina, Greenville, Spartanburg, South Carolina, that was the end of the inquiry for me. Okay, I admit it's pretty ignorant, but that's the way it was my first six years in Congress. Then I was out of Congress six years doing commercial real estate law again, as Peter just said, in Greenville, South Carolina. I had the opportunity to run for the same seat again in 2004. That's the year that uh, our son, the eldest of our five kids, had just turned 18. So he was voting for the first time. And he came to me, he said, Dad, I'll vote for you, but you're gonna clean up your act on the environment. His four sisters agreed, his mother agreed, <laughs> a new constituency. Um, and so uh, they can change the locks and the doors to your house, you know, very important to respond to those people. 
And so, uh, so uh, that was step one of a three-step metamorphosis. And, and by the way, my son was going to vote for me no matter what, right? It wasn't in his economic interest to vote against me. <laughs> I mean, like some of you, he just started college. And uh, so he's going to vote for me no matter what. Um, I think what he's really saying was, Dad, I love you. And you can be better than you were before. So how about make this English 2.0, new, the new and improved version. So that's step one. Step two was going to Antarctica with the science committee, seeing the evidence in the ice core drillings. Go into that in Q&A time if you want to. Um, step three was another science committee trip and something of a spiritual awakening, which seems improbable, right? On a godless science committee trip because we all know that all scientists are godless. Well, <laughs> apparently not, because this Aussie climate scientist who I was snorkeling with was clearly worshiping God and what he was showing me. We were snorkeling together. He'd go down, you know, and we'd go down together. He'd show me something. He'd come to the surface. I'd be <laughs> heaving for air at the surface, and he'd be, has amazing lung capacity. He'd be excited to tell me what he'd just shown me. I could see in his eyes, it was written all over his face that he was worshiping God. So I knew we shared a worldview before any words were spoken. You know, uh, St. Francis of Assisi supposedly said, I don't know if he actually said it, but supposedly he said, preach the gospel at all times. If necessary, use words. And so Scott Heron, this Aussie climate scientist who's now become a very dear friend, was preaching the gospel. And I heard it. Later, we had a chance to talk without the snorkels in our mouths. And uh, he told me about conservation changes he was making in his life to love God and love people, people who come after us. So he says he, he rides his bike to work, does without air conditioning in Townsville, Australia, a pretty hot place as much as possible, hangs the family's clothes out on the line, all to consciously love people coming after us. So I got right inspired. I wanted to be like Scott, loving God and loving people. So I came home and introduced the Raise Wages, Cut Carbon Act of 2009. Note to self, do not introduce carbon tax in midst of great recession mm -hmm. when you represent perhaps the reddest district of the reddest state of the nation. It will not go well. <laughs> and it did not go well at all. <laughs> After 12 years in Congress, I got 29% of the vote in a Republican runoff. The other guy got the other 71% of the vote. Rather spectacular face plan in politics. You know, usually you don't lose that badly unless you've been indicted or something. <laughs> I don't know, though. Now, uh, an indictment may improve your stock. I mean, your stock price may go up. Uh, but but used to be that, you know, if you had indicted. Anyway, I hadn't been indicted. I was just on the wrong side of Tea Party orthodoxy. It wasn't just that, by the way. I, I, I and as Peter uh, indicated in the introduction, there are some other things where I was on the outs with the Tea Party. Um, I voted for President Bush's rescue of the banks. Um, that's a, a mortal sin, according to the Tea Party. There is no grace available for that sin. Um, um, as for conference of immigration reform, although we never called it that. Um, let's see, I'm confessing all my sins here. What else did I do? Oh, uh, I- um, I'll be the priest. Yes, okay. And, and I, uh, I, vote against the, I vote against the troop surge in Iraq. And there's something interesting and encouraging about that. Orthodoxies, political orthodoxies appear fixed, but they're actually quite fluid. Because you know, the same people who told me, how dare you vote against our president, George W. Bush in this troop surge? because I had conservative concerns that he was doing nation building, he's my friend, but he was doing nation building in Iraq, are the very same people who stood on chairs and cheered every time Donald Trump trashed the whole effort in Iraq about once a month. The same people cheering for Donald Trump when he trashed the effort when they were told me, how dare you vote against our president? So oddly, there may be an encouragement there about political orthodoxies. And then, uh, let's see, I also uh, uh, wrote an op-ed favoring gay marriage, which did not go over well. Um, and so, but my most enduring heresy was just saying that climate change is real and we need to do something about it. Because as 08 happened and the global financial crisis happened, um, it 
uh, you know, the, the orthodoxy within the Republican Party really switched to become Tea Party orthodoxy. That's when it happened. And so early 08, as I was telling a class earlier today, do you remember Newt Gingrich and Nancy Pelosi are on the couch in an ad? The only time those two people have ever sat on the couch together, I'm pretty sure. Anyway, so uh, we don't agree on that much, do we, Newt? No, Nancy, but we agree climate change is real. We need to do something about it. That was early 08. By the end of 08, Newt had switched. We don't know, he said, about climate change. Two things had happened. One, global financial crisis. October of 08, the wheels are coming off the financial system. So Newt and other Republicans are basically saying, take that one bead off the worry strain. You don't need to worry about that one, climate change. Don't forget about that. Because people were worried about their houses, their mortgages, their jobs, the collapse of the banks. And the second thing that happened was a secret Muslim, non-American socialist had been elected to the White House. He's none of those things. But sadly, my party called Barack Obama all those names. I think to say the truth, it's code language for you. There's a black man in the White House. It worked politically, but it's to the great sadness of the country, really, and to the, my party that we did that to Barack Obama. And so we became the people that were against whatever he's for. So like me back with Al Gore and the climate change thing. And so after I lost, a foundation came to me and said, you are an unusual zoo animal, English. Um, actual conservative, you know, 93 American Conservative Union rating, 100% Christian coalition, 100% national right to life, A with the NRA, zero with the Americans for Democratic Action, that's a liberal group. 23 by some mistake with the AFL-CIO. I was really hoping for a zero. I don't know how I got a 23. Um, they said, uh, actual conservative, will you speak and write for the proposition? I said, well, if the food is good and the cage is nice, and the cage is very nice, I'm here at Hamilton College and the food's been great. And so uh, Rihanna tells me the breakfast is particularly good at the end. And so um, uh, I said, yeah, we'll do it. And so now it's this thing called RepublicEN.org, where conservatives who care about climate change. And if you're one of those, we need you to join us. It will take you about 45 seconds at RepublicEN.org. All we need is your zip code and your email address. Email address so we can stay in touch. We won't hound you for money. We only ask once a year. If you want to give, that's fine. Otherwise, we've got people to take care of that. But the thing we need for your zip code is we need to make you visible to your member of Congress and to your two senators. Because they're starting to get it that you exist, that there are conservatives who care about climate change. Um, and if you're not a conservative and you want to help anyway, just send all your relations, your cousin, your whatever, your Uncle Charlie, whoever it is, some colleague, somebody you, you know it as a conservative, send them to our website so that they can see that there really are conservatives who care about climate change. So that's how I got to this. Um, um, as to my assessment of where we are in the situation, it's like this. Um, I, I am in the market distortion camp. I think what we've got here is a problem of economics that has an environmental consequence. If we fix the economics, we can fix the environment. The problem is we dump into the trash dump of the sky for free without a tipping fee. And if you did that in the city dump here in Clinton, the dump would be overrun. But the reason you charge a tipping fee is so that uh, you control the amount going to the dump, right? And it's appropriate to charge a tipping fee. And so the way that I see it is this, I'm Inglis Industries. I make a useful product to society, a nice widget, it's useful, helpful. But in my process, I burn a lot of stuff and I create an awful lot of CO2 and small particulates come out as well. Um, most of those small particulates become a problem for my neighbors. My neighbors, because the real estate, the residential real estate near my fe uh, fence line and my plant, is cheap real estate, the cheapest in town for residential purposes. The people who live there are disproportionately poor and disproportionately people of color. I foul their lungs. I get away with it. It's a pretty good deal for me. It's a pretty good deal for my customers, too, because I sell a cheap widget. Stinks for my neighbors. Stinks for my competitor across town. She's got the new equipment. Makes a similar product. But I beat her every day in the marketplace because I get away with 
externalizing the negative uh, externalities of my product. I just dump them in my neighbor's lungs. So how are you gonna fix that? Well, um, in the case of climate, of course, um, what we've got to do is that's a worldwide problem. And so what we at RepublicEan.org think should happen is that I should be held accountable for those emissions because those emissions of CO2 become a proxy for the, the small particulates that are fouling the lungs, right? You know, CO2 doesn't foul lungs, but the small particulates do. And so if you, if you make me accountable for those I'm probably going to be heard to local member to heard to say the local member of Congress. No, you can't do that. You realize what would happen if you put on that carbon tax. I'd have to I'd have to buy new equipment. I'd have to charge more for my product. My customers would be powerfully mad at you, Congresswoman or Congressman, because now they're going to be paying more for the product. People that someday I hope to hear back from many conservatives. Go ahead, go ahead, buy the equipment, Angus. Stop fouling your neighbor's lungs. It's contrary to a moral code. I mean, it's a biblical law. You know, I can't do on my property something that harms your person or property. So it's a violation of biblical law. It's a violation of English common law, which became American common law. It's just morally wrong for me to foul my neighbor's lungs. But it's also, an economic problem because my competitor across town is going to be the happiest when I'm subject to a carbon tax because now she says, fine, now I can take you, English, because my product is clean. I don't have that overhead of the carbon tax. And now let's compete on that level playing field to see who wants my widget as compared to your widget. And she'll beat me. And I think that's what conservatives should respond to and say, yeah, we call it creative destructionism, the capitalistic system. And it sure is a powerful force and it makes things move very quickly. And so do we need to move quickly? Yes, because this is an answer to that question. It is, an, it is of urgent uh, need that we address climate change. And whenever I'm talking in a situation like this, I'm often hearing the scientists ringing in my ears from the science committee saying, faster, 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 we've got to go faster. We really don't understand all the feedback loops. This could be a lot worse than we think it is. Please go faster. And so it is, it is an urgent matter and uh, we need to be about it and we need to find the quickest path to get there. Last thing I'd say to you about in this introduction part is, just consider this. What if I could show you a way to get the whole world in on climate action? What if it's as simple as changing what we tax? And what if Americans are really good at this innovation thing? That's what we go around saying to fellow conservatives, those three what ifs. Thank you. I want to, I want to, um, so I think you both laid out, um, I think some, uh, two perspectives here. And I think there's, there's a lot of, I mean, there's, there's common grounds in that you're both approaching, uh, this issue and the need to, you know, hold polluters accountable and, and uh, ad obviously address the issue of carbon emissions. I want to, though, I want to push further and maybe um, highlight some different perspectives that you have. Um, and um, I mean, I, I, I think, and this is something I've, I've been thinking about for some time, that a lot of sort of climate politics is, is in many ways go, and going to become a debate about, do we move in the direction of more mar market-oriented solutions, do, uh, less regulation, relying on financial incentives, or do we move in a more kind of transformative holistic way that involves really changing fundamental aspects of our economics, our politics, and, and um, aspects of the way our, our society is organized, including you know, issues of race and class, gender. Um, it, and so these, these two approaches are, they, they push in, in uh, different directions. And one area where I'm, I'm gonna 
to bring up, or I think that there is sort of crystallizes this contract is the, the issue of permitting reform. Um, Cause I think you have different perspectives on this. Um, and it, it raises some really interesting and, and, and very sort of important dilemmas that we're gonna have to address one way or the other and, or somehow. Um, so just to briefly introduce the topic, as, as we rapidly build up the infrastructure for a green economy, we're gonna need to expand the grid, build renewable energy generation facilities, we're gonna to need to mine for uh, all sorts of metals like lithium. And this is gonna directly impact a lot of communities, especially lower income communities and communities of color that as Rihanna said, has, has really borne the brunt of climate degradation, including very serious health impacts. So um, the, and the Inflation Reduction Act with its incentives for green energy infrastructure and also has a number of concessions to the fossil fuel industry raises some of these issues of environmental justice. Um, and there are tools like the National Environmental Policy Act and its provision for environmental impact statements, public participation in lawsuits that have empowered communities to resist potentially harmful infrastructure projects. And yet, at the same time, some people argue that provisions like these prevent lots of things from being built. And given the emergency or urgent nature of climate change, we need to streamline the permitting process and in many cases override local opposition. And that's an issue here in this area in central New York and a lot of rural communities are really uh, opposing large uh, solar facilities. So, and I think the two of you have, have rather different perspectives on this. So I'd like you to maybe talk a bit about that. Yeah, if you want to start off, since I went lame. Uh, sure. Uh, so it's like this. You know, I think that generally speaking, there are three ways to fix climate change. You can regulate CO2, you can incentivize clean energy, or you can price in the negative effects of burning fossil fuels. First, you can regulate CO2. That would work here in America. You can do that. You can clean up local air here. Problem is you can't regulate Chinese emissions from here in America. In fact, if you regulate here and they don't regulate there and manufacturers pick up and move from here to there, you actually just went downhill on solving climate change. Because when they get there and open the plant in China, they're emitting more than they were emitting here. You just went downhill. Second approach is to incentivize clean energy. That's what we did in the, clean, in the Inflation Reduction Act, most misnamed act ever, <laughs> too, cute, too cute by half, I think. But if I were still in Congress, by the way, and that were freestanding and not a reconciliation bill, I would have probably been voting for those, some of those credits. Why not? Well, you got your opportunity to go for some of those credits. My understanding of what the power of those credits is informed by private sector estimates that say that the cost, the tax cost of those things, is going to be two and three X the cost that the Biden administration uh, suggests that it's going to be. What that tells me is those private sector folks like Bain Capital and, you know, uh, all the consulting aid firms, what they're saying is, gee, but those are some powerful incentives. We're going to deploy a lot of wind and a lot of solar, and hopefully some nuclear and hopefully some hydrogen. We're going to deploy a lot of that stuff because look how powerful those credits are. Problem. That will do great things here in America, but you haven't affected the economics of Chinese firms. Because if you're a Chinese firm, you don't pay American taxes, so the American tax credits are worthless to you. So you may, in the second approach, end up in the same place as the first approach, which is cleaning up local air, which is great, commendable. But you're not, so, let's, you're not yet solving climate change. So the third approach is to price in the negative effects through a domestic carbon tax that's paired with a dollar for dollar reduction in, for example, payroll taxes. So you deal with the regressive impact of a carbon tax. A carbon tax by itself hurts poor people. But if you untax their payroll by reducing their, their FICA tax, the Congressional Budget Office says that swap off payroll on carbon dioxide benefits the bottom 70% of Americans. It's only the top 30% that would do worse. So it actually addresses regressivity. But here's the key. Once you get that domestically, 
then under existing World Trade Organization rules, you can apply that same tax to imports. And that's when it goes worldwide. Because what happens then is we impose a carbon tax on a sheet of flat steel. Let's say coming through the port of Seattle right now. They stole the technology from us, manipulated their currency. Uh, they don't have environmental protections in China. Okay, I'm sore about all those things because we have new core steel in South Carolina and they make much cleaner steel. But here it comes, cheap Chinese steel coming through the port of Seattle. We apply our carbon tax. They object in the World Trade Organization. You can't do that. Impermissible tariff, they say. We think they lose that case based on precedents in the chemical industry that say, no, no, you could have a content tax and this would be a carbon content tax. And so if we're right, and it's upheld by the WTO, 24 hours later, because they do have an amazing way of reaching consensus in China, um, not a very fair government, not a very nice government, but doggone efficient. Dictatorships are very efficient governments. Um, 24 hours later, why would they have that? Well, they just paid in Seattle a carbon tax that they could collect it themselves, in which case the tax money would be in Beijing, not in Washington. So it's in their interest to follow our lead. And here's the key thing for that conservative cousin of yours, no international agreement, no bowing and scraping at the UN, no protracted negotiations, just a bold move by the United States that says, we're ready to act, we're gonna deal with carbon, we're gonna tax it, and China, you're gonna pay it. And the whole world is in getting access to this most lucrative market in the world, to use the power of the American market to get everybody to follow. By the way, it's what Europe is getting ready to do to us through, the, uh, through their carbon credit market. And wow, well, we're going to have to buy into those carbon credits starting in 2026. So that new core steel is going to be calling up Nancy Mace, the first district congresswoman in the future and saying, yo, Nancy, you realize that starting in 26, we're going to have to pay, a, pay essentially a tax to, enter, uh, to take our steel into Europe. Would you rather have the money here, Nancy? by doing a carbon tax here? Or do you want us to pay it to Europe? Light bulb's gonna go on in the US Capitol. And then the big light bulb's gonna come on, which is, oh, we could do that to China. And then, like I say, then you get the whole world following. And now you're solving climate change because you got 8 billion people seeing the true cost of the burning of fossil fuels because it's built into the price of everything. And so that's, that's how we, I see this, we see at republician.org, we see this unfolding, is how this gets to that place. And Peter, I'm not sure I'm answering your question yet. Your question was about how to- The permitting is- The yeah. permitting. So right. permit is obviously key to that because if we're gonna build those nuclear power plants, if we're gonna build that solar, in the desert and ship it to California where it's desperately needed. We have to have power lines. And the challenge is that FERC, the Federal, Enver Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, can only dictate the placement of natural gas pipelines. It can't dictate the placement of power lines, of electric lines. And so you have to override, in some cases, local communities in order to get the power. And either that or Either that or override or sweeten the deal for them. Because the problem is the people that are going to be trans or are going to have the power lines over their heads are people in Kansas out on the farm where the solar is, let's say, or the wind is, and they're getting it to Chicago. And so what did that do for me if I'm out there on a farm in Kansas? Maybe what we got to do is figure out a way to pay them a little bit so that the folks in Chicago pay that farmer in, tech, in, in Kansas for crossing their land, pay enough that the farmer says, hey, hey, right here, right here, I got, I got the back 40, you can come right across it and I'll plant weed underneath there and you'll be fine, we'll all be fine, as long as you can pay me. So you gotta figure out some way to compensate these people that are gonna be um, uh, crossed with the power lines, but it's essential to do that or else, you know, and I would say about NEPA uh, specifically, the whole planetary system is at risk. And yes, the environmental community has effectively used NEPA to stop this or that project 
And oftentimes it's based on that plus working with the Endangered Species Act to do some things to stop some project. But all those species are gonna be at risk. If we don't get off of this, uh, this, these fossil fuels and get onto renewables and get it to where the population centers are. Yeah, um, so obviously building out renewables as quickly and efficiently as possible is very important. We um, at Roosevelt, I've written about it in my personal capacity too, come in differently on the question of permitting for a few reasons. One, there's very little data that NEPA is actually the stranglehold when it comes to renewable energy. Often when you dig in, you see that even delays around approving projects often comes down to state capacity, capacity in agencies, which was gutted under the Trump administration, right? Um, so I remember, forget, I think it's, um, there's like one engineer in the Southeast region, and I forget exactly which federal agency um, that does all the approvals in the Southeast for Project One. Like that's the level of state capacity that we're talking about, right? There's also um, um, delays on the ends of developers where they're not turning in the things that they need to in the time frame, right? There's a lot of reasons, essentially what this boils down to, there's a lot of reasons um, that projects hit bottlenecks and there's not a lot of data that NEPA the review process is the reason, right? The other part of it is that there's a lot of players. So the US has a really difficult energy system and the fact that it is primarily, almost exclusively privately owned. And so there are tons of actors, including utilities with a lot of power over what happens on the grid who may or may not want to have a transition to renewable energy, right? Chief among those are utilities, right? So there are other players in the mix. The last reason that we have taken a different stance on permitting reform, which is to say, we don't think permitting reform streamlining is bad in and of itself. There are forms of it that we would support. The part that we don't support is the painting of both NEPA and particularly public engagement right, as the thing that is slowing down projects. Because when you dig down, people aren't saying like, let's get rid of NEPA. In general, largely they're saying, let's get rid of the public engagement aspects of NEPA. Let's, you know, we don't need to have public comment. You should not have the ability to sue, right? Which I think having that ability, particularly, for frontline communities is really important because often when it comes to a lawsuit, they have gone to the public meetings. They have tried to talk to the FERC commissioners. They have, right, they have gone through the steps that they were supposed to go through. And so NEPA, as unfortunate as it, as it is to have to resort to a lawsuit to stop something, it is still a crucial protection and I'll say this because I think it's important to note that we have to build renewable energy, but we are still in the midst of a fossil fuel boom in the US, right? The Biden administration just paused approvals on LNG, new LNG projects, right? That haven't been approved yet because the US and without those projects, the US is still the number one exporter of natural gas in the world and likely will remain so. Right. And so we also cannot live in a fantasy where power doesn't exist, where fossil fuel projects are not being built out at the same time as renewable energy projects. So even if you're aiming at renewables, stripping away the ability to sue, limiting public comment, all those sorts of things also make it easier to build fossil fuel facilities. Right. So you will also still see an uptick in emissions. Right. Because those facilities and they're not. Again, I think we have to think about power because these facilities are not being built everywhere, right? They are often being built, especially if you're talking about 
uh, liquid natural gas, right? They're often being built in the Gulf in places that are already overburdened by pollution, whether that's chemical pollution, often that's chemical pollution. Um, and so there is sort of also no reality, not only are, where you're not building out fossil fuels, where taking, weakening NEPA does not empower more environmental racism and injustice. Um, and I do think, and this is often where even among sort of other folks in under the democratic tent, um, where we hit an impasse, because I do think, I understand that there are necessary trade-offs, but I do think we have to start at solutions that do not empower more racism and injustice when there are other ways forward. Um, so for instance, in permitting, one of the things that we have talked about is there needs to be more federal planning capacity and support. Because part of the reason it's so hard to even build and develop renewable projects is because there, there's a really fractured landscape. There is no cent centralized planning in the sense that different projects, where we're looking across the country and saying, these projects need to be built here. This is how we minimize the impact of find places that minimize environmental impacts, or you know, we're making we're trying to make sure we aren't putting too many projects in the same place so that we're overburdening those areas, right? We don't have that capacity. We need more of that capacity. The other thing that we found out um, as more people study this is that public engagement is key and actually moving public engagement earlier in the process and making it meaningful so that people know when they speak into those processes that they're being heard and projects are actually changing to the extent that they can because of their feedback, that matters, that builds more support for the projects. And also that diverts the energy back into the process, into the system that you um, have designed, into the processes that we have designed. Because I think one of the other fictions of permitting reform is that if you cut out public engagement, people will no longer be mad mm -hmm. because that's worked forever. <laughs> um, but what you're really gonna see is people are gonna turn that energy into other things, whether that's protests, whether, right, whether that is public campaigns, right, whatever that may be. And so it's really in our interest, particularly at a time when institutional trust is so low to, put people back into the processes that we have designed and show them that they are meaningful and that they are useful. Because the other thing that I think, and this is where I'll end, is that we have to remember that even though the climate crisis is an emergency, it is also climate action and climate policy is also a political project and a long one. We might be, we have a limited time right, to address climate change, but we are gonna be living in the consequences of what we have done and what our ancestors have done and the changes that we have made, those feedback loops for a long time, right? So mitigation adaptation is not something we can be like, we gotta go to the wall. I was about to say ball, so I can't say that. <laughs> uh, but we can't go hard and fast. Mm -hmm um for 10 years and not think about the next 20 and the other thing is elections happen in the u.s all the time so there's so many checkpoints for momentum to stop and the last thing you need is backlash right so we need to constantly be thinking about how do you do this in a way that builds trust that builds lasting momentum right that builds enthusiasm because we it's not a case where we can do one thing and it's just 10 years we not only have to be doing this for, I would say at least the last, the next half century, right? At least. Mm -hmm. Not only are we signing up for so 50 years of work, there's literally two to four year checkpoints, right? And so it is not in our interest to piss a bunch of people off. And I think unfortunately, as much as I would even love to be like, yes, do state offices, local opposition, we have to think about that because those people are gonna vote. Right, and so we constantly have to be thinking, how, how are we doing this in a way that is going to help 
future, the prospects of this political project. And this is the last thing I'll say, and y'all are gonna be tired of me by the end of this because I'm gonna say white supremacy at least 50,000 times. Um, but I will say that this is also one of the ravages of white supremacy that I feel like we're living in is that for so long questions of what do you do with stuff nobody wants, we answer with dump it on people of color. But because the grid already exists, that's not really possible in the same way. But the toolbox we have is still one of domination and submission, right? And we don't have the tools yet to, how do we find a mutually agreeable solution where you treat everyone in the process as if they matter? And I think that's one of the central challenges of climate change and climate um, action, because it is such an ongoing project, is that's what we have to figure out to, what to do. And I feel like permitting reform is one of the canaries in the coal mine, where it actually is giving us an opportunity to think about that. How do you do public engagement? We know that like um, community meetings tend to only to serve those who are most powerful, who talk the most, who have the time to show up. But there's no reason that public engagement only needs to happen through community meetings, right? What about liaisons and agencies who are culturally competent, who are going out and doing roundtables in different communities, right? There's so many ways that we can start to think through how do you get consent? How do we move away from domination and submission to think about how do we sort of do some collective problem solving in a different way? And I think for me, permitting like, so many other things in this issue area is a chance to think about and explore that because we are trying to build a multiracial democracy and those are the tools that we need for that. And we aren't gonna, whether it's climate change or another issue, we're not gonna get out of needing to build that type of toolbox. I think so I was listening to you talk and like god I wish carbon taxes worked the way you say <laughs> like I think it can right but I also think there's so many um and to be clear I'm not necessarily I'm not really opposed I'm pretty like agnostic on carbon taxes I think if we could get them cool I would prefer dividends, right? Like I would prefer the money to largely go right back to people as opposed to a payroll tax reduction because I'm a liberal and I love some tax revenue, baby. <laughs> Can't have social safety nets without it. So I don't wanna see that, but, um, but I thought it was really interesting, but I am always curious does that resonate with conservatives? Because they don't like taxes. No, it's it's hard. It, it, it's really hard because what you have to do is you have to say it's revenue neutral, and then you have to explain revenue neutrality. You know, so one way to get it is put in the carbon tax and then dividend the money back. There might be some people here from Citizens Climate Lobby. I'm on the board of full disclosure. I'm on the board of Citizens Climate Education. Um, it's a 501c3 that supports the CCL thing. They that's what they want to do. I'd be completely happy with that. That's a dividend where you collect up the carbon tax, you send it back to the citizenry per capita. Yeah. That addresses regressivity. But I do believe it's, uh, if, I, if you gave me my choice, it'd be the payroll tax because that is administratively quite simple because you don't, it doesn't involve mailing a lot of checks. And it just means you cut back, you, you reduce the payroll tax. And it is, it's the tax, of course, that funds Social Security. So you can't make Social Security any worse than it already is. It is a Ponzi scheme that is going broke. Social Security is. And so I can say that I'm not running for president. Mitt Romney said it in Florida and it killed his campaign, right? Thou shalt not say in Florida, if thou art a Republican, that Social Security is a Ponzi scheme. It is. Um, it was established when people would live not much beyond 65. Now they live way beyond 65. Just do the math. And that's what the actuaries at Social Security are apoplectic about, is it's going broke. Not for anybody currently on Social Security, 
but for the students here, it's going broke unless we do something about it. Well, one thing you can do is broaden the base through a carbon tax. It makes it so Social Security has a new source of income that is broader than payroll. And so it actually helps Social Security a little bit. So it's really a pretty neat thing. But here's the other thing. If that sounds familiar, that revenue neutral, border adjustable carbon tax, and you're a progressive and you're saying, why is that resonating with me? What that guy up there from South Carolina, some sort of redneck from South Carolina with a very conservative old business he's doing. Why does it sound familiar? Well, it's the same thing Al Gore has been for for about 30 years. I asked Al um, several years ago if I could keep on saying that. He said, hold up, Bob, if you're talking a low, I said, no, sir, I'm talking a substantial carbon tax that's steadily rising. He said, yeah, fine then. You can tell people what you're for at republican.org is what I've been for for about 30 years. And so there has been erosion, though, on the left for support for, for carbon tax. The Green New Deal did it. Yeah, it, it, it did because it, it basically, it did. It, it, the Green New Deal did do that because it basically said, let's do a lot more than climate. And of course, I'd love to do a lot more than climate because there are a lot of injustices in the world that need to be addressed. But what I would beg everybody to consider is if you want to alter the capitalistic system so that we can then finally get at climate change. I'm here to tell you we're toast, that we're not gonna get there. We're not gonna get there now. But if we, but, or I've heard this other all said, we need to change the US constitution completely in order to get at climate change. We need to make it so California gets more than two senators compared to Wyoming, which has two, you know, because California has 52 more times the people than Wyoming does. Wyoming has one House member. California has 52. They both get two senators. So some people go around saying, we need to change the U.S. Constitution. If we do that, then we can eventually solve climate change. To which I say, good luck with that and hunker down because we are hosed. If we've got to change the U.S. Constitution in order to solve climate change, we're hosed. Um, and so I'd say if we've got to change the capitalistic system in order to solve climate change, we're hosed. Um, we just got to figure out a way to work with what we got and work very quickly to get this uh, thing fixed and, the, and, and make sure you keep on thinking not about the United States. The United States is the one most responsible for most emissions in the history of the world since the Industrial Revolution, but we are no longer the major emitter. So you've got to get the world in. And if your solution is domestic only, just realize you're not solving climate change. You're cleaning up local air, which is commendable. But you've got to get the world in on it. I don't know. I mean, I agree that you have to get the world in on it. I don't think the, the Green New Deal was domestically focused, but it had a huge international impact, right? Like there are Green New Deals in different countries, right? I forget. Um, but I, I forget exactly which well, Latin American country, but their president ran in part on like a Green New Deal S campaign and won. So I do, I get, I get what you're saying. I don't disagree, but my, um, that it is an international problem, 100%. Um, I guess I have a couple, I often have a couple of questions when we're talking about climate change and just looking at it as a market failure. One is what happens with all the inequities, right, that occur in response to the climate policy, right? For instance, you're talking about carbon tax. Um, and so to be clear, the main response to climate change that was popular um, amongst those who cared about climate before the Green New the advent of the Green New Deal was carbon taxes or cap and trade. The Green New Deal killed that in part for the reasons that you're talking about. But I think the larger thing that it did was talk more and bring industrial policy back into the mix and the question of public investment. Um, and that is ultimately the tack that we've taken so far as public investment and industrial policy. 
Um, but I'm often intrigued because, so for instance, like cap and trade, which is different than a carbon tax, kind of similar. The difference is that you can um, trade and cap, cap and trade. So companies can trade credits, can sell credits, what whatnot. Carbon tax, that's not the case. It's just applied. But one thing that they found, for instance, with uh, cap and trade was that it could intensify in California. They had cap and trade for a bit. It intensified um, environmental injustice because yeah. it sort of it crowded it in two places. Yeah. Um, and so carbon taxes don't work exactly like that. I get that. But I do think that's an example of an inequity that can come across, come that can happen in response to climate policy. Right. Um, and I think that is one of the dangers of just the carbon tax with very little other climate policy is it leaves it up to the market how they decide to decarbonize. So they and what we do know uh, for fossil fuel companies in particular is that like fossil fuel companies, at least the ones that were founded in the U.S. like Standard Oil, have been racist since their inception. Right, like they purposely did not allow black people to work there because they did not want them to have access to those jobs. So they only got, so oil in the US was unique in an industry because it is essentially was entirely white and has stayed disproportionately white, particularly at the leadership levels. Right, so you, this, what I'm trying to pull out is like the private sector has all sorts of other considerations other than public good when it's going to be deciding how to decarbonize. And so with those inequities that are created, I guess my question is always, what do we do about those, especially if you can plan that, if you know that those are likely to happen, because once a system is in place, and I'm not unbiased when I say this, because I'm a Black woman and I've seen it happen all the time, a system is in place and you're always gonna deal with the equity stuff later. And it never happens. So my question is like, how do you think about the chance of creating inequities as a result of say a carbon tax, especially the ones that we can know or imagine are likely, like do you feel a responsibility to address that in the creation of the policy itself? Or do you think that like, that's just something we, address later well i think i think in my example for english industries there's no such thing as english industries but the small particulates are really what you're talking about in those asthma cases right that's, right of course that's yeah. the problem so if you get at those by a proxy of this carbon tax you're actually addressing that asthma problem but like Very for instance carbon capture doesn't necessarily take in particulate matter right like i've heard different things but what we do also know is that like CO2 capture isn't going to be put on every part of a facility Correct. that emits, yeah. right? That's just not how it works. So you could very well still have particulate matter, even as you're reducing CO2. And we know that carbon capture is the decarbonization, not the only tool, but it's one of the ones um, preferred by private industry, say, well, well, fossil and, fuels or petrochemical companies. And, and I'm not sure that uh, uh, carbon capture and removal is going to work. But no one is. But it's, but it's like this: <laughs> if it causes Republicans in Congress to open their hearts and minds to it, I will be glad to talk to them about it. Okay. Because what we're dealing with here is a need to put together a bipartisan and therefore durable policy, like you say, thirty or fifty years in duration. And if you think you can do that, if you're a progressive here tonight and you think you can do that on the left, just consider that. You got to hold the presidency, the House, the Senate, and a majority on the Supreme Court for 30 to 50 years. Not much chance of doing that. That's a low percentage shot. So what you got to do is figure out a way to open up the conversation and make it so, hey, the conservatives are talking about carbon capture and sequestration. Okay, we'll talk about that. Don't know if it's gonna work, but we'll talk about it. Um, and then what you do is you get people moving in the same direction. Politics is the art of the possible, not the perfect. And so you can't let the perfect become the enemy of the good. 
you have to go with this and say, okay, if we can get Mitt Romney in, if we can get John Curtis, who hopefully is a replacement U.S. Senate from Utah, in, we can get some others in and make this bipartisan, you can make it durable. Because if it's done on one side of the aisle, as Obamacare proves, pendulum swings, people try to undo it. They didn't, weren't successful with that, by the way, or they picked the pieces of it. But pendulum swings. And so we got to get durable policy. Is there any way to do that and not remove equity considerations, though? Because that's what always bothers me is I'm down with working across the aisle. I do believe that obviously if things are bipartisan, they can be more durable, but it's troublesome. And again, I'm not unbiased here because it always feels like equity is the thing that gets chopped. It's always the question. And I've only lived in America for 34 years, right? I've only been alive for that long. Um, but it has, we don't get back around to it often. It does not happen. And so my question is like, do you see a path where we can keep some of, like we can consider to think about like, how do we do this in a way that harms the least people or doesn't, right, create compromise on the backs of people of color? Um, right, because I carbon taxes are not inherently racist or anything like that, but that approach does not necessarily ask questions or answer questions about who benefits and who suffers in any way that's different than what we have now. And I do think that also threatens durability in a, in a country that's becoming more diverse and that is gonna be majority minority in the next 10 years. Yeah, I think it goes back to that thing about biblical law. I can't do all my property, something that harms your person or property, right? And so that's, that's the fundamental problem. And so we're not loving our neighbor. And so, but really the economics profession could actually, the dismal science could be a part of the help there because the things that, uh, Carol Campbell once told me this, he's, a, he's probably the most effective governor in modern South Carolina times. He's died too early of Alzheimer's. He used to tell me, he said, Bob, it's all about economic development in South Carolina. If you just get the standard of living up, you will fix teen pregnancy, you will fix drug abuse, you will fix, he'd be down the list. And really look at the statistics, that's what happens. You fix that problem of people not being, being pushed down at the bottom of the spectrum and not being able to succeed. And that's where you run into all those troubles. So you can, so I, I sound like I'm only about economics, but I will tell you that it's not, this carbon tax is not a sufficient condition to solving climate change. You gotta do other stuff too. So we probably are gonna have to do some direct air capture. We probably are gonna have to do higher cafe standards for cars because the, the, the price signal and the transportation signal uh, sector is fairly weak. And so you're probably gonna have to do higher cafe standards as well. So carbon tax won't fix it all instantly, but for all the economists in the room, I can tell you, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure of this, there isn't, there, you, it's hard to find an economist who doesn't say the first and most obvious thing to do is to do a carbon tax, then talk about other things, but first do that. And then you've got massive movement in the right direction in economics. And that force pushes pretty, pretty hard. And, you know, it goes down to, to you know, like I said, Al Gore has, has told me I can say where he's for what we're for, or we're for what he's for. And, you know, what we Republicans, conservatives really hate about Al Gore is he's making money in the free enterprise system. We think it is wrong to make money in the free enterprise system. I don't know why it is that Al Gore gets to make money, do you? Um, I mean, it's a joke, you get it? In other words, he's making jack at Apple where he's on the board. And so for some reason, we hate the guy. I don't know why, because he's got a big house in Nashville. Do you know that? That's why we hate him. I hear this all the time. Al Gore's got a big house and he flies in corporate jets, to which we like to say republican.org, good on him. Wish you had a big house, have us over for a big party. 
But once you figure out how to, the heating of that house and pay the true cost of it, you're probably going to close off some of the wings. Mm -hmm. um, once you see the true cost of heating that pool, you're probably going to drain it in January and fill it back up in May. And then things start moving, right? And so apparently it's what Al Gore also understands is, gee, you want to move something fast? Incentivize the free enterprise system to deliver innovation and it'll go rapidly. And if I could just, the proof of that is these things. Is anybody here old enough to remember a bag phone? You're not, but there was a bag phone. I had one in my first campaign. It was in a satchel and you, it had a cord on it. You picked it up and you talked on it. It was a dollar a minute. It worked in two of the three counties. Had to keep it plugged into the cigarette lighter, right? That was telecommunications circa 1992. You can see it in museums, museum, students. It's probably in a museum. Um, this thing is now virtually free for me to talk to my kids wherever they are by WhatsApp, right? That happened because of the free enterprise system, but it started with government. Yes. Government invented the internet, and then Judge Green busted up AT&T and created competition. So you've got to, you do start with government, but then you give it to the free enterprise system to have this massive competition with the guy making stylish stuff that would cost a little bit more, and the other guy um, making more practical Microsoft stuff. But whichever one you want, but the prize was a great big market. Small margin, big numbers, things I, move. I'm gonna, we, we're like running low on time for questions. So this has been a really interesting discussion. But I wanna open it up for a, at least a few minutes to yeah. get, um, so sorry, we're gonna... stomped all over your questions, <laughs> Peter. I'm stomped all over. No, your but I think that this this exchange is really interesting. So oh, let's good. let's um let's get a chance for some questions here. Uh, I thought it was really interesting about um getting the world to buy in on climate change. Um, could you explain the part about how getting China to buy in again? I'm a little confused. Well, there's, I'll let you talk more about, I'm not an expert in China, but I do think it's important and when we talk about China's emissions to also acknowledge that China has invested far more than the U.S. in renewable energy technologies and green technologies. And so they make a I don't even know what percentage of market share. I think it's over 50% of the EVs in the world, right? Solar panels, et cetera. So I think that we have to, what um, Bob is saying is true, but I think we also have to talk about the other part because that investment and that public investment in renewable energy and other parts of clean tech, we actually, it did inform, um, some of the thinking around industrial policy, like with Mariana Mazzucato, that then uh, trickled into the Green New Deal, just the idea that the government can in fact invest in green industries and try to make that a, a bigger part of the economy. Um, so I will say, say that I'll let Bob answer the rest about, um, about China, but I will also say that like getting the globe to buy in is important, but there's also power aspects. So I don't know if you all follow something called like the loss and damage fund, where richer nations have promised and as part of the Paris uh, Accords to create a fund for uh, countries in the global south and developing countries to transition to renewables and clean energy. And the US has fought both paying the share that it promised, paying its fair share, and right, fought to get the loss and damage fund placed in the World Bank, which will make it much less effective, right? And so we have to have the world buy in. But again, that's also not without questions of power. And we have not been honest brokers when it comes to that. And I just think that that is important um, to know. Yeah, and it's also true that we we are the ones mostly responsible for the climate change. I mean, we our, our emissions, historical emissions. But try telling that to an American citizen. I can tell you right now, if Joe Biden went on television tonight and said, listen, it's our fault, 
and we're going to pay into this fund in a big way, he'd, he'd slap out, lose in a landslide to Donald Trump come November. I mean, he's already at risk of losing today. If he did that, he's toast. And so that's the practical reality of the politics here, is you can't go to Americans and tell them, hey, listen, you, you got to pay up for what you did, what your, your, what your father did after World War II when he came home and built this economy on coal. You got to pay now. Wow, the politics of that. I don't know how anybody sells that anywhere. Maybe in the faculty lounge, right? But you can't sell it anywhere else. There's no way you can sell it. And so the thing about China is China is now the whipping boy for both Republicans and Democrats. You notice that Joe Biden is doing exactly what Donald Trump did yeah. with respect to China. And so it's, it's the one thing that works for him politically when it comes to international relations. And so while that's in some ways unfair, as Rihanna just said, because China is doing a great deal, a lot of stuff right now, but they are still emitting a great deal yeah. and they're building like a, a coal plant a week and they really do are putting one in service a week. And um, it's a serious problem. But the carbon border adjustment mechanism, C, uh, CBAM, is the way to make it work for them because they are an export platform. They export certain, you know, a lot of stuff to us. If you tax them on the way in, then they've, it, it dawns on them that we could have collected that tax ourselves, in which case, Within our system in China, we now see the impacts of burning fossil fuels. It's built into the price of everything. And my example always is, uh, there's somebody near here working for a McDonald's, second or third job it is for her. We've done a carbon tax. Her gasoline is going up $30 per ton price in carbon dioxide. Her gas goes up by 30 cents a gallon. Her electricity by $11 a month based on that $30 per ton price on carbon dioxide. She's hurt by that regressive, but we cut her payroll taxes. So now she's got a bigger paycheck. She's in charge of getting for a bridal shower, she's got to go to the, the plates. So she goes to the grocery store. She sees paper, she sees plastic. Right now they're roughly the same price, maybe plastic a little more expensive, right? Go back after the carbon tax. Paper's going up a little bit because you got chainsaw gas and all that stuff. Plastic, wow, it's gone up. It's all petroleum and all natural gas all the time. So she's standing there in the aisle with her bigger paycheck in her pocket. Which one is she picking? Well, we're for freedom at republican.org. If she just loves plastic, the way you take the plate and you tip it a little bit and the food goes splat right on the floor, if she just likes that feature of a plastic plate, go ahead and buy it. It's freedom. But if she's like me and most people, she's going to say, let's see, those paper will do just fine tonight at the bridal shower. I think I'll get the paper. That happens on every shelf in the store. That there's some renewable product that's now made cheaper because it's actually cleaner and not paying as much carbon tax. Mm -hmm. The dirty made accountable is now more expensive. Nobody's regulating that. Nobody at the cash register is saying, no, no, you had plastic last week. You can't have it this week. No plastic this week for you. No, not that. It's just she's there in freedom choosing paper, plastic. I'll choose paper. Mm -hmm. But then through the CBAM, carbon border, uh, carbon border adjustment mechanism, it goes worldwide. So 8 billion people in their grocery stores are choosing between the paper plates and the plastic plates. And they're choosing paper. And so it spreads rapidly because of the simple price signal and people taking care of themselves and enlightened self-interest. Again. I will say, I think we do have to be careful about saying like what all Americans will take or not take. Because I do think there are some Americans who are open to the idea we owe somebody reparations. We get that. <laughs> you know, so I think that that is um, important, especially, and I think like even acceptance of something like loss and damage, that's very different across age lines too. Younger folks totally get that right um it, and... maybe they do but high propensity voters are seniors not young people and so so again if joe biden said that tonight he had an oval office address tonight saying that 
He's yeah, I'm not saying that it won't have a negative effect, but I, I just think that like we have to be, some people are in America are, are susceptible, like, will respond to those and I think that again when I know it's like when you say people are like we have to change the constitution but I do think climate policy does highlight those sort of imbalances like in the sense that if we did have a political system right that was more representative right if we had a popular vote in an electoral college we think about those as separate issues but those are issues about democracy right and if we had right, more of a functional democracy in that um, way, climate policy would likely be a lot easier to pass and maintain for, because for instance, people of color are more likely to believe climate change is real and to support climate action. But we're in a political system where those voters' voices are not held, right, do not have the same power as a white voter, whether that's because of access to voting, right, whether for any number of reasons. So I do think as as wild as it can be to hear, like we have to change the constitution, it is important to recognize that those linkages, as much as it might throw us back when we hear them, are real, right? And are connected to the issue. Give me another question. Oh, I don't know I'm pointing to like thank you. <laughs> right, so uh mr english i think you spoke on this a uh, little bit but i also want to hear um this is miss gunner your take on it um which is like so my interest is the international environment we see so you spoke on you using applying like a carbon excise tax as kind of like like a like a tariff effectively to uh translate this domestic approach to climate change to the international scene. And I want to see, Ms. Gunwright, what your thoughts on that are. And Mr. Inglis, if you have anything to add, please. please yeah, please. no, um, I think I think that like that makes a lot of sense. That actually was part of the Green New Deal, um, was like a carbon border adjustment. So it is something that like I've been aware of just like, and that I am supportive of because honestly, carbon taxes, as long as you can make them not regressive, they are useful tools. I'm certainly like, like I said, I'm agnostic on a carbon tax. I think it depends on how it's structured and like where the price is, et cetera, a number of things. But I think like a border adjustment, that is helpful, right? In, in terms of it's an international problem, helping to standardize sort of the, the floor is, is helpful. In incredibly helpful. Um, and I think the more things we can do like that, the better. Again, the question is also how do we make sure that folks in the global south are informing and shaping these mechanisms and not being acted upon? And about the, the, the important thing to note about the global south is that, you know, there was a time back in those 1990s when I had that, that bag phone where there's a big discussion about how the global south will never catch up with us in telecommunications. Golly, they got to put in all this fiber optic network. Nope. They leapfrogged us into cell phone technology. And so when we get better batteries and better solar, because we are pushing, a, a, when, when the free enterprise system says, golly, there's money to be made. Yeah. And now we can we got to put a lot of money in that research. We can get better efficiencies out of solar cells and we can get better batteries that aren't reliant on maybe lithium yes. and cobalt um, and people digging it out with their hands and essentially slave labor. Yes. Um, if we do that, then they're going to, they're going to, they're going to leapfrog us again, which is, um, I hope it's not something real bad. Um, what did you do? <laughs> must be something. You and said it, slave labor. Yeah. And look, they, were, they were coming to get me. <laughs> and so, uh, yeah, they're going to leapfrog us into microgrids is what I would suggest to you. Oh, so the global south, this global south is going to be benefited by the better batteries, the better solar efficiency. And actually, the wealth of the, the developed world is going to end up I mean in my terminology, be a blessing to those folks to, to light up their lives with more energy, more mobility, more freedom. And I can tell you, 
If you go to conservatives and you tell them that language, language of abundance, it's what conservatives are used to hearing. That's the language they're used to hearing. And it's something that resonates with them. If you tell them you got to do sacrifice and do with less, I, it doesn't work. Um, and I would say to you, it also, I'm not sure it works really on the left to center either to talk actually about sacrifice and doing with less. Um, and so it's just that on the right of center, people are more open about that, that we want to hear about abundance. And so if we have abundant energy that's actually cheaper and cleaner and better and faster because we made new ways of making it, and lo and behold, we sell it to the global south, we make money and create more jobs here, then we're really liking it, right? And so that's how you can get conservatives saying, hey, this isn't such a bad thing, is it? And remember that third thing I said was, and what if America's really good at innovating? What if we're really good at that? And that's, um, you know, to whom much is given, much will be required. Much has been given to Americans. Much will be required. And so get innovating and make it so that really you do bless the people of the global south with a better battery and better solar. Yeah, I don't know. I, I, I don't think I go with the blessings language um, personally. Um, I get it though. Um, and I do think it probably resonates with all these things you're talking about for sure. But I do think he's right. Uh, he, Bob, is right. Um, in the sense of innovation, it, that is one of the, the main things that developed nations and the global North can do. That really is our responsibility to be coming up with better batteries and dumping money in R and D and that sort of thing. That is 100% one of our responsibilities in this. Well, we uh, first spirit of discussion. Thank you both. I, I, sorry, we didn't, I didn't have to reserve as much time for questions, but I think this has been a really good discussion. So I wanna thank both of you and um, thank the audience. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bob, our team panelists.